Okay, welcome back, everyone. I'm, as I look around the table, the important people are here, so the rest of them can uh, they can kind of wander in from lunch as they, as they might. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn things over to Jason Didden with Council staff to provide us a presentation on the 2023 and 2024 butterfish specification. So when you're ready, Jason. Thank you. Uh, so overview, talk a bit about stock status and the assessment, uh, review the current measures, talk about some recent fishery performance, move on to the SSC recommendation, and then the monitoring committee recommendations and the, the specs uh, themselves. So we had a research track assessment um, followed by management track assessment. Um, it found that it was not overfished or experiencing overfishing. Um, there is a good bit of kind of concern about the reference point generated by the assessment for overfishing. Um, but the reviewers still thought that it was unlikely to be overfishing, even considering that uncertainty. Um, if uh, um, kind of to integrate some industry perspective, um, one of the working papers was this industry perspectives working paper. Um, it kind of goes a little bit into some of the history of the butterfish fishery. Folks who are interested in that, if you dig through the SSC meeting, you should be able to find that uh, find that working paper from, from the assessment. Uh, so the current primary measures, limited access, three inch mesh, if more than 5,000 pounds. Um, there's a good bit of discard set aside, both for the long fin squid fisheries cap and other potential discards. Um, there's a slowdown that goes in. There's no trip limit to start. Um, outside of the mesh requirement. But then if the fishery approaches the 1,000 metric tons of the quota, goes to a 5,000 pound trip limit. That's really been untested since that's been in. Um, the fishery has been well shy of the quota. The current ABC is just shy of 18,000 metric tons. Um, and the current quota is about 11,500 metric tons for 2022. Uh, so there's just fishery performance over time. Um, and you know, in the 2000s, um, the, you know, the, the fishery kind of evaporated on its own accord, but then was thought to be overfished, shut down, prevented from reestablishing. Subsequent assessment found it had never been overfished um, and has been slow to redevelop, primarily due to market conditions, according to the AP. Uh, just prices over time, fairly stable the last few years. Um, Revenues and landings over time, um, so it's been kind of a kind of a, a jagged redevelopment of the fishery. I think folks try it a bit, um, and uh, you know they'll try it in a year, see if they can find sellers, um, and again, not really catching um, in the last few years uh, close to the quota. Uh, highlights from the AP: um, just that other species are more lucrative than butterfish. COVID issues persisting, especially around shipping issues. Um, you know, we got some input on this year, even though the fishery performance report is more focused on last year, um, we typically get some input on the current year and just flagging that the good long fins, good fishing and high fuel prices will further kind of discourage people from targeting butterfish this year. Um, ongoing concern about just our precision of biomass estimates in the past um, given some of the history of the assessments and the negative effects on long fin that that has and um, could potentially cause in the future. Um, and also kind of continue to get concerned about, um, you know, overall prey availability, where butterfish fits into that, the applicability of the two thirds um, uh, natural mortality reference point that's been kind of the default in recent years. And I think I'll turn to Dr. Rago now. I believe he's on. He'll walk through uh, the SSC's input on butterfish. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'll go through these uh, SSC recommendations as quickly as I can. Um, in terms of reference, one, or, one through three are summarized here. Uh, the SSC re received the results of the research track assessment um, and, uh, and, and the level one management track assessment. Uh, and, and importantly, the timing on those was very tight. And I thank uh, Chuck Adams for uh, doing a great job of uh, 
providing that information to us in a, in a timely manner. Um, the bottom line is the SSC recommended to use the F equals two thirds M as the biological reference point. I'll address some of those issues later. Um, and the set, the recommended ABC of 17,267 for 23 and 15,764 for 2024. Uh, the basis for these um, uh, decisions are, you know, the first is to determine the overfishing limit, the coefficient of variation that, uh, and there's attachment four in the SSC report is a, is a four page table that goes into a lot of detail as to the basis uh, for uh, that that determination, um, it's it's a lengthy table, but it does provide a, a, a tangible record of of the thought process and the the, the factors that went into that uh, decision. Um, based on the council risk policy and the estimate of current stock biomass, uh, the P star that is the risk of overfishing uh, is near the, is at the threshold that is 0 0.49. So. Um, actions taken, uh, you know, are designed to uh, have, uh, at worst, uh, a 49% chance of overfishing. Um, there was no change in the underlying estimate of natural mortality, which is very high for fin fish, but not too high for a species that lives this, such a short lifespan as butterfish. Uh, and then we acknowledged, uh, you know, that there is a new state space model, um, the, the, the Woods Hole Assessment Model, or WAM. Uh, that uh, is allows for a lot more flexibility in terms of how the populations are are modeled. Um, next slide, please. In terms of um, sources of uncertainty, uh, Jason had already mentioned uh, the uh, uh, the reference point issue. Um, one of the consequences or outputs of the model at the research track was that the F50 percent or the MSY proxy was over 6, uh, 6.0. So for those of you keeping track, uh, that means that there's a, on an annual basis about one fourth of a percent survival or 99.75% would die. Um, the research track peer review panel um, felt that this was um, somewhat of an artifact and, and unlikely. Um, and when it was updated, it became 5.6. But nonetheless, the it was considered problematic and one aspect of that is that you know if that were applied that is a, a that high of a, a reference point to determine the OFL the realized biomass under that level of fishing mortality would be lower than any estimate in the 40-year time series so um, for for a number of reasons um, uh, that one was was not accepted as a basis for uh, going forward and uh, the SSC uh, elected to use the F equals two thirds M, which was also a recommendation of the research track peer review panel. Um, as noted, that there are issues with the, the scale of the population. Um, when we use a Q, and a Q in this sense is, is catchability, and it is the product of the gear efficiency and availability. So um, when, it, when it's set at point, 0 0.2 and it has a empirical basis for that, but it means that most of the stock is not available for estimation. Um, and um, this can be a, a problem if that variability changes over time. Uh, as Jason noted, there was a lot of uncertainty in the discard estimates and uh, early in the time series, this is problematic. Uh, over time, uh, monitoring has improved uh, in terms of coverage. Uh, and estimation methods. So um, it has gotten better, but there are some earlier problems. Um, some technical details on, on procedures for uh, filling in holes in, in data are, are described. And then um, the other, other one, and I'll touch this on the next uh, uh, slide here, but it's the uh, uh, an estimate of trying to est of, of re, re, re calibrating M, that is, is it 1.2 or is it something higher? Um, but that was not successful. So next slide, please. Under ecosystem considerations, uh, the uh, we noted, uh, and as you have seen in the annual uh, state of the ecosystem reports, 
there are some major changes for a whole variety of species in terms of their condition factor. Um, and um, that, was, that was considered a, um, uh, a major uh, kind of ecological process. We still don't have the, the smoking gun, so to speak, as to what factors led to that, but there are a lot of stocks, a lot of species which had lower th than um, uh, average condition factor, that is the, the plumpness factor, so to speak. And then um, I, a point that I, I made earlier here, uh, you know, despite the, you know, a, a fairly concerted effort to look at all the fish, marine mammals and seabirds um, and, and try to sum up their diet data and figure out, you know, do they account for the estimated uh, mortality that, that's, uh, that we use in the, as natural mortality in the model? And it was insufficient. Now, that, what that means is there's something missing. Uh, and you know, a number of uh, possibilities were were uh, suggested, including perhaps uh, uh, ilex squid as a possible predator on on butterfish, since they do co-occur in, in many instances. And then finally, um, the, the SSC made some recommendations. So next slide uh, for research. Um, uh, they, they, they emphasize the need for uh, understanding survey catchability. Uh, this is a combination of both empirical estimates, such as those conducted by the, uh, the, the trawl advisory panel, but also uh, oceanographic uh, estimations, such that uh, as had been done in, in the past. Um, because this fish is so short-lived, um, there were some thoughts that you know using a, a, a shorter time step that is six months or three months or something on that order might be more appropriate than an annual uh, time period. The um, methods used to estimate maturity have a huge impact on the um, uh, determination of the biological reference points. So um, the, that, that that aspect uh, was, was considered to be important to, to further um, address. There's always the issue of um, uh, improving ways of estimating uh, discards. And um, as we have noted in, in previous presentations to the Council, um, the adequacy of port sampling is, uh, uh, is, is crucial for uh, age structured assessments and for basically uh, the vast majority of, of stock assessments um, in the Mid-Atlantic. So um, I mentioned the, the possibility of ILEX uh, consumption. There, have, there are some papers uh, on, uh, on the West Coast about squid predation on, uh, on uh, small forage fish. So this may be important. And then, and then finally, uh, a technical detail this, to work on methods for uh, improving those, those H length keys, which translate length frequency distributions into H frequencies. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to you, uh, Jason. Appreciate that, Paul. Go ahead, Jason. So this slide just summarize, summarizes that SSC recommendation, um, which followed the staff recommendation also. And kind of, it seems to be working fairly well of late. Um, but before I kind of move on, if folks have kind of any questions on kind of the assessment or the SSC input for Paul it might be useful just to, to pause before we move into the, the more technical spec stuff. Yeah, that's fine. Um, thanks, Jason. Is there anybody, does anybody have any questions for Paul? Any thoughts? Yeah, I don't see anyone in the room. Uh, anyone from the audience? Any questions? Anyone online? There we go. It's all you, Jason. Okay. Um, so the monitoring committee took those ABCs, um, thought about fishery performance of late, um, didn't see any cause for any major changes to the management system for butterfish. Um, there previously was kind of a breakout of some um, uh, discards in terms of um, the kind of potential directed fishery versus um, just discarding in other fisheries besides 
directed butterfish fishing or longfin squid fishing um, eventually, uh, or the, the, um, I think the monitoring committee didn't see that as necessary going forward. Just looking at um, you know, uh, cap discards and other discards. So basically how it breaks down is you know, we have those ABCs from the council to the 5% uh, management uncertainty buffer um, that I think has just been carried over through the years because there's um, you know, some uncertainty about the discards for butterfish. Also, the closure provisions are um, as of yet untested. Um, if you take out the ACT buffer, uh, you get the ACT. Um, currently, the council has been setting the longfin squid fisheries butterfish discard cap at 3,884 metric tons. Um, that has not, at that level, it hasn't presented an issue for the longfin squid fishery. It's been quite a bit, a uh, good bit below that. Um, there's been discussion by the council in past years of should we just get rid of the cap. Um, the monitoring committee's recommendation over the years has been, um, you know, the longfin squid fishery seems to be living within that cap and it provides um, some certainty that you're not going to have a super high discard rate that could create instability in future specifications. Um, just looking at the, um, at the average discards plus the standard deviation um, from 13 to 21 um, would be another 1,248 metric tons set aside for discards for a total discard set aside of just a bit over 5,000 metric tons. Again, that's probably um, you know a bit more than is necessary, but does help create stability in the fishery by making it very unlikely to end up with an ACL ABC overage. So, um, taking out those for discards, uh, you get a landings quota or DAH domestic annual harvest um, of a bit over eleven thousand metric tons in 2023 a bit under 10,000 metric tons in 2024. Um, so, you know, fairly close to where we are now in 2022. Um, and then just maintaining that closure provision where when you get within 1,000 metric tons of the quota going to a 5,000 pound trip limit, the original rationale for that was since, you know, we've got some quota uh, to use here, um, no need to go right close to the limit and then have a low trip limit that might create some kind of regulatory discarding issue. Um, try, to, try to avoid that and have uh, you know, a, a fair bit of buffer where you close a directed fishery, but still have a high, fairly high trip limit um, that's not gonna cause some regulatory discarding issue. Uh, so again, pretty similar structure as is current, just with the updated uh, ABCs um, and that slight um, kind of consolidation of the discard breakdowns. Um, so uh, that's um, it. I uh, would be looking for a motion from the council to um, to adopt some specs for 2023 and 2024. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, before we get to the motion, let me see if anyone has any questions for Jason. Peter Hughes. Not a question, but I can make that motion when you're ready. Okay. Do we have a motion prepared, Jason? Let me just change the uh, webinar sharing here. Hold on. Stephen, can you stop the share on your machine? Thanks. You need to make me a presenter, please. Or you can pull it up. Um, Okay, I don't know. Can you increase that uh, text a little bit on the top, that top line, which is just regular text above the table? So Stephen, do you want to make me a presenter? I can pull it up or are we going to pull it up?
Okay, I think we're ready to roll there. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, I'll take start taking bets on whether or not you in you say one of these numbers wrong. <laughs> I don't know that we necessarily need to read each line of the table. I think just reference to the table as long as Chris is okay with that. Um, and the folks online can see it. So why don't we just make the motion and reference the table and then we'll go from there. I'll save you the save you the trouble of reading it all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe the two council people to my left are making bets on whether or not I can get through reading the entire motion. So I appreciate that. Uh, there is a bit of feedback coming from somewhere. And this is not a committee motion. Um, so we wouldn't need a second on this. And the motion would read, I move that the council recommend the specifications in the following table for butterfish. And that table is referenced here. Um, and I will not read it into the record. It is, it is referenced here. Um, so that is my motion. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I wonder if you'd be okay with adding for butterfish for the 2023 and 2024 specifications, or I guess it already says specific. How about just the dates, the years, just for clarity? Thank you. Okay, we have a motion um, made on behalf of Peter Hughes. Do I have a second? Dan Farnham has his hand up to second the motion. Peter, did you want to speak to the motion at all? I think Jason and Dr. Rago laid it out perfectly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any discussion of the motion? Is there any one from the public that has any comments regarding the motion? Peter, your hand's still up. If you want to put that down for me, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one from the public and seeing no hands uh, around the table or online, I'm going to call the question uh, to the council. Is there any opposition to the motion? Seeing no opposition, are there any abstentions? Seeing no abstentions, the motion carries by unanimous consent. Thank you very much, Peter, for making that motion. And Jason, thank you for the presentation. Dr. Rago, thank you as well. Is there anything else to come before us, Jason, on this? item on today's agenda? Not for Butterfish. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on. Um, Jason's gonna stick with us a bit uh, through the rest of the afternoon, and we're gonna move on to our next topic, which is the report on the LX Squid research track assessment process. So I'll turn it back to you, Jason. And our presenter for that had a, had a, an adjoining meeting, so she'll be available at 2.15. It should still be about 15 minutes ahead of time, but so we may take a few minute break. You know, what we, we could do, Jason, if you're ready, we could just skip to the next one, perhaps get that done in a 15 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes on LX 2023 specs. Do you want to do that now? and then go back, or would you prefer the other before that? Um, the, there's some interrelationship there between the assessment and, um, and the specifications, but I think, I mean, the specifications are coming out of, um, from yes, so I, I think that's fine. We 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 can do that. I, I don't think that will cause a problem. Yeah, as long as it doesn't complicate matters. If you're okay with it, then I'd suggest we do that, and that way we can pick up after the other presenter is available, just in case he or she is uh, a little late as well. Sure, Stephen. Can you go and bring up the presentation for ILEC specifications, please? Okay, um, so 
ILLICS 2023 specifications. Um, preliminary in the sense that we expect the SSC to review them again in early uh, in early uh, 2023. And I'm not sure if, if I'm, am I doing that, Stephen, that it's disappearing? Okay. And can you click on, okay, I think we're okay now. Okay, um, so same kind of format as with Butterfish. Uh, roll through a bit on stock status, talk about the current measures, performance, SSC, and then monitoring committee recommendations. And again, just setting for 2023 at this point. So uh, research track assessment, there was no management track assessment um, as originally scheduled because research track failed to produce biological reference points that could then be churned through a management track assessment. Um, but the peer reviewers did agree that the stock was likely lightly fished in 2019, um, although they had some kind of like all cautious caveats about um, how to interpret that given the lack of reference points. But overall, they did agree it was likely lightly fished in 2019. Um, and then there were a series of indirect methods uh, that were used at the SSC to support a recent increase that just went into effect within the last day or two uh, for the 2022 ILEX fishery to 40,000 metric tons. Um, and the plan is for those indirect methods to be updated by the center uh, for the March 2023 SSC meeting. Then the SSC will reevaluate um, and if necessary or if appropriate, recommend um, you know, an updated ABC. Uh, the analyses that the, account that the SSC used for this year are already updated through 2021 data. So there's really not much new data to add right now. But for that March 2023 meeting, the plan is the center would add 2022 data, update it, and then the SSC will uh, will kind of reconfirm or change their ABC recommendation for 2023. Uh, so current measures, limited access, uh, there's not much discarding of ILIX, but there is some, so there's a small amount set aside for discards. Closure at 96% of the quota, that's new based on um, the um, updated specifications the service was published uh, with a 40,000 metric ton ABC and uh, the 2022 quota is now just above uh, 38,000 metric tons. So just landings over time, um, kind of highlighting the, the high landings in the last five years um, through 2021 was really kind of an unprecedented five, unprecedented five year uh, high run of, of landings for, for ILEX. Uh, a, a bit of a drop in price in 2020, but uh, a little bit of a rebound in 2021, but that's um, you know, just a few percent and a few pennies per, um, per, per pound. So fairly consistent prices, 2020, 2021. Um, and then revenues have been following the increase in landings and relatively stable price. Um, so, uh, you know, um, I like the unprecedented nature of, of the high landings for those five years, uh, same with revenues. Uh, so fishery performance report, this is a bit of a repeat because you saw this um, earlier when you increased the ABC to 40,000 metric tons, we had the AP meet early in the year to support that decision. Um, but again, they flagged that similar conditions 2020 to 2021 from their perspective. Again, that price increase is, 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 is pretty small. Um, again, highlighting that this goes into a world squid protein market. There are several substitute products. Um, just one of those uh, in 2019 had around 250,000 metric tons of, of product landed. So kind of going into a, a larger international market. Um, the AP requested that they, you know, fishermen continue to be involved in trying to understand some of the environmental linkages uh, with the high squid productivity recently, um, and kind of got some opposing perspectives regarding whether or how there should be additional um, kind of considerations, catch set-asides um, for ILEX related to its role in the food web 
um, kind of and as it might relate to the council's ecosystem approaches to fishery management guidance document in those kind of opposing perspectives or either that it's either sufficiently accounted for or, or, or more accounting should be done for, um, for illages forage role. Uh, so with butterfish uh, and the AP fishery performance report with butterfish, we tried kind of a little new thing. We knew thing pe people were gonna be busy fishing. Uh, we had a bit of a do it yourself fishery performance report, do an online um, kind of questionnaire to the AP. We tacked on um, just uh, an ILIX question to get a little input on kind of real time 2022 uh, performance because the ILIX fishery has been slower in 2022. Um, and the kind of reports we got from the AP on that is one, high fuel prices combined with the good long fin fishing has dampened interest in ILIX for 2022. Um, folks also noted that um, the early summer water temperatures had not warmed up as much in recent years as they had in recent years and lack of warm core rings observed, again, compared to some recent years. Um, also got a comment um, that uh, a, a higher, uh, a still higher ABC for and quota for ILEX would be more reasonable, kind of with a comparison to to what the quota is for skates. Uh, so this is the performance through um, some point in July. Um, again, you can see 2022 has been a slower year. Um, we had the quota monitoring folks up at Garfo just kind of do like a a, a multi-year quota monitoring page um, and thought it was kind of useful. Yes, this year is slower compared to the last five very high years. Uh, that horizontal pink line kind of down low points to where we are this year. Um, so a good bit slower than the last five years, but um, you know, when you look at the last 10 years or so, kind of still um, in, in, in the middle and, and not totally atypical for what we might see for, for Ilex squid. And I'll pause for Dr. Rago now, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, appreciate the uh, uh, int introduction. Um, the uh, SSC uh, received the research track assessment uh, and, and uh, provided uh, uh, an update here. And uh, just for the, for the sake of the record, just want to reiterate the fact that I, my work supported the decisions made by the SSC. So therefore, I recused myself from the discussions and as SSC chair, uh, and also Mike Wilberg served as chair during uh, this particular session. Um, as Jason noted, one of the key outcomes of the research track assessment was that there was not a um, uh, a new stock assessment model, nor was the uh, any attempts to update or revise the biological reference points successful. So um, that puts uh, this process into into a bit of a, a different type of procedure. And essentially, uh, it can consider it as a as an analysis of risk policy um, and um, and how uh, the uh, current levels of stock uh, removal uh, would. Uh, vary uh, over time with respect to uh, potential but not approved uh, biological reference points. So one, for example, is the F equals two thirds M, which we just heard was the basis for the decisions for butterfish. Um, that if, if that had been used, again, conditional on if, there would have been about a 5% chance of exceeding um, the, the two thirds M guidance rule. Uh, also suggest um, a, a very low rate if you used a 50% escapement policy that is used for um, market squid uh, on the uh, on the west coast and and a number of squid fisheries around the world and also is a basis for um, many of the um, uh, squid uh, MSC certifications uh, that are done. So um, basically, the SSC recommended as provisional to continue with 40,000 metric tons for 2023. And then uh, they'll receive an update um, of the analysis using uh, the uh, data through 2022. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we commented on the, the research track assessment, some of the technical details and advances at the um, 
last meeting of the of the council um, in June. Uh, one of them was on this generalized depletion model. Uh, the, the CIE reviewers um, felt that it was uh, a good a good uh, approach, uh, but they were not unanimous in terms of recommending or pursuing further further development of that. So uh, there are some uh, scientific issues that need to be addressed, uh, particularly with respect to parameterization. Um, the uh, research track reviewers also uh, did not recommend using a plan B smooth. And the reason for this is that there are so many generations that occur between annual surveys. So as a consequence, um, it's um, much more um, uh, uh, or much less likely to have a high uh, autocorrelation. It is uh, similarity between years such that uh, the predictability is, is, is useful. So they said uh, that's probably not a, as, as useful. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, the SSC commented on the on the value of the uh, ILEX aging work that was supported by the council and also the seasonal biological sampling supported by industry. And then the, also the noted the, that the center uh, did support through um, a uh, support for a uh, postdoc to, to take a look at some of the, the more complex uh, biological uh, aspects of, of squid aging as well as their um, uh, micro uh, element or micro constituent uh, uh, aspects of their otoliths or statoliths, excuse me. Um, now, these, uh, you know, we noted, of course, that uh, this, this ensemble approach of multiple models, you know, just looking at uh, ranges of variables and trying to distill sort of by um, uh, convergence of evidence and excluding certain possibilities. This is what led to those broad decisions or broad statements that, in fact, the population is uh, it seems to be lightly fished. Um, the research track reviewers, as well as the SSC, recommended a, a more broad-based or uh, management strategy evaluation, similar to some of the, the work that you reviewed yesterday with respect to uh, the uh, uh, summer flounder. Um, and there was in the in terms of the in the suggestion box kind of category here that uh, you know they, they did note uh, that the, the the timing issue with the research track and the management track assessments and these are part of the growing pains of of the implementation. Um, but uh, they they were concerned that you know that the comments uh, of the reviewers were not available until May, um, and then uh, you know not. The CIE reviews were, were were not available until just before this SSC meeting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, kind of a general theme um, was the, the sort of the issue of managing without an assessment. So this is in sort of the data poor category or data poor bin. Um, but they noted that uh, that some improvement in the terms of reference uh, might be appropriate to sort of deal with some of these things because there wasn't a, an entirely consistent mesh of what was treated at the research track assessment and what was reviewed um, by uh, the uh, and, and what was reviewed by the SSC at its uh, at its uh, July meeting. So. Um, they, they, they point out this distinction that, you know, what NOAA Fisheries uses for the stock determination status and what the SSC needs uh, you know, are not always ex the, the same. Um, so uh, there were there were some some general concerns that uh, this whole process um, could could be improved and, and really focused on the need of how to improve management or manage in the absence of, uh, of, of, an, of an assessment. So next slide, please. Um, they, uh, uh, a number of, one topic that did come up uh, and it was an actual term of reference was um, uh, the uh, indirect method. Uh, this is sometimes uh, called the, the Rago method. I think that's when it's referred to in the pejorative sense. Um, but uh, it is, um, uh, used basically to um, one of the improvements will be to take a look at the uncertainty and the estimates of abundance. Um, so right now it looks at 
uncertainty in, in catchability, uh, availability, and natural mortality. There's also another piece of uncertainty, and that is the estimates of the biomass themselves. So each, each sampling design has a realized estimate of the standard deviation. So that factor will be incorporated into the next version uh, of, the, of this process. Um, and one of the other recommendations was to, was to develop a, you know, a package um, shiny app or something of that nature that will um, facilitate the transfer of this uh, approach um, to the center. Um, and so, uh, again, the, 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 com, the SSC noted that this is uh, kind of a, a series of cumulative band-aids, um, uh, you know, using these indirect methods and that, that, that really there does need to be a longer term plan for, for improvement. Um, and then uh, another focus, another item for the suggestion box is that uh, given the short-term lifespan and the highly variable nature of its biology and ecology and, and all these, these factors, that um, the, the management process also needs to be uh, you know, considered. And, and in fact, in my own personal viewpoint, I think that there have been considerable uh, improvements in that uh, uh, in that process that uh, the, the timing of the update and the uh, decisions that are subsequently made seem to be um, uh, seem to have worked at least in the last several years. Um, in terms of sources of uncertainty, this is term of reference three. Um, this will be the uh, that um, you know we've already mentioned this this. Uh, lack of a of an OFL um, and the reliance on data poor approaches. Um, there's there's this uh, continuing uncertainty over the fraction of availability. Some of the work that is ongoing with respect to oceanographic processes uh, and, and work at the center and in collaboration with industry and uh, other other um, investigators from the Woods Hole Oceanographic and uh, Rutgers University and so forth have, have been, you know, particularly promising um, there. Um, as a usual, um, we, we really don't understand stock recruitment dynamics in SQUID very well. Um, so again, that complicates this whole uh, decision-making process for it. So these are unlike um, just about everything else we manage except for LALIGO, and then they're more complicated than LALIGO in the standpoint that they're more off the shelf than they are on the shelf. Um, and so, you know, uh, the factors that, that underlie good versus bad years are, are, are critically important uh, and, you know, some way of uh, being able to not only understand it, perhaps forecast it but would, be, uh, would be valuable. And then finally, there are some, some technical recommendations <clears throat> in terms of how we might uh, consider the uh, joint variation that is the potentially the correlated aspects of um, catchability, um, availability, and natural mortality uh, to uh, to see what the implications of those might have in terms of evaluating risk um, in the uh, um, of, of alternative catch limits. So with that, I thank you very much and turn it back to you, Jason. So again, uh, summarizing, um, the SSC kind of stayed with the 40,000 metric ton ABC for now, um, and uh, then they'll reevaluate and update. So the monitoring committee um, didn't have too much to add beyond that. Again, uh, the ABC was just updated um, by NIMS to the 40,000 metric tons with a 96% closure threshold for the council action earlier this year. So staff plans to kind of expand the range of uh, ABCs in uh, NEPA analysis, um, probably like 20 to 60,000 metric tons to facilitate implementation of whatever the SSC recommends in March, 2023 for the 2023 fishery. So we've kind of almost moved by default to a year to year in year um, kind of tweaking of the ILEX uh, specs for several years running now, 
um, NIMS um, ha staff has really kind of worked hard to facilitate the um, execution of that and the timeline that makes that, that, that it's actually meaningful for the fishery. Um, and uh, that's kind of the plan to continue that going forward, um, at least for next year anyway. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Paul, for your presentation. Uh, let me ask and see if anyone from the council has any questions they'd like to ask regarding the preliminary specs. Seeing nobody, well, a couple hands just popped up. Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's not so much about the specs themselves, but I guess, um, so is this the second, well, it's the first research, research track assessment for ILIX in this new sort of process from the NRCC, but prior to that, you know, benchmark assessments. So is this, is this like the second benchmark assessment where, you know, overhaul assessment, whatever phrase you want to use, where everything is re-examined, where there's not reference points that are coming out of that assessment? So, I mean, have we been in this not really having reference points coming out of, you know, a benchmark or research track for a couple of cycles now. And we're using, you know, alternative methods that have been developed. Yeah, I mean, I think it may have all been maybe nearly 20 years since the previous research track. I, uh, I, Dr. Rego may have that because I think the SSC has noted the, the time. 2000. 2004. So, um, so essentially, yes. Um, you know, I, I'm I had discussions with people. I'm not sure that it's knowable. Um, kind, kind of given the the nature of the critter um, and its biology. Um, I think some you know, advancements in understanding some of its growth and um, and and age kind of occurred in an incremental fashion. Um, this go around, um, and um, so I think the answer to your question is yes. We're kind of stuck in this in, in this loop, um, and I think we'll have some additional discussion in a few minutes about you know kind of the assessment process and and how that may have affected where we are now. All right. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Anyone else from the council before I go to the public? Okay, seeing nobody at this time, let's go ahead to the public. Is there anyone in the audience has any comments? Okay, we've got a couple hands online. Let's go first to uh, Jim Fletcher. Go ahead, Jim. Is it possible that Eric Reed is still on NAFO? NAFO is going to meet August the 26th. The prior administrator of NOAA did not want to ask for elect squid from the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization. But I do not understand if no one's fishing why it would not be possible to request elect from the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization and add it into the quota. Twice we have shut this fishery down. Why don't we just ask what what is the international I'll call it a boogeyman that NOAA and National Marine Fisheries will not request ELEX quota through uh, Mr. Reed. The meeting's on the 28th. Is there anything that can be done to try to request extra quota out of North Atlantic Fisheries Organization? It frustrates me that we shut a fishery down when there's squid there that nobody's going to catch. Thank you for your time, and I'll shut up. Thanks, James. All right, I'm. I, I was having a little trouble hearing Jason. Was there was there any question directed? To you in that comment, I and mean, we've tried to chase down the the NAFO issue a, a bit before, um, and 
you know, to date, no U.S. fishing vessels have, um, you know, ha ha have applied. Um, the Nas and the NAPO fishery is subject to, there's a 60 millimeter minimum cod mesh size and, um, and a July 1 start date. Um, and uh, I think there are, our previous kind of conclusion has been that changing the U.S. NAFO quota allocation or moving to a shared single stock would involve considerable difficulty in international negotiations with an uncertain outcome in terms of what the U.S. and I'm just reading from a, a previous summary blurb that I'd created before um, with an uncertain outcome in terms of what the U.S. might end up with for an overall final quota. Um, so it's kind of an issue that's churned, but not one that to date has has kind of seemed ripe that would allow the U.S. to tap a substantial, you know, have a high probability of allowing the U.S. To, to tap a substantial amount of extra quota. Okay, thanks, Jason. Eric Reed. I, I could skate the issue because technically at this moment I am not a commissioner. I haven't been reappointed yet, so <laughs> I could get out of it that way, but. Um, yeah, the reality, uh, the NAFO quota right now is 34,000 tons, out of which, depending on where your data set comes from, it may be 10%, plus or minus 5% is actually caught. So my position on that has been that the rest of it is additional escapement above and beyond what's already provided for in the regs. But to uh, the U.S. quota is 459 tons. Uh, it has been said that if we wanted to send boats up there for to go fishing for that quota, that there would be the ability to perhaps get excess quota from other um, contracting parties. That's what they call members. But uh, it's a long boat ride. And um, the fish are usually inside the Canadian border. So it, it would be... It, it, it's a highly risky boat ride, so that's why nobody wants to go catch it. There, you know, there uh, we're in area three and four, and, and uh, the Canadians are in five and six. Um, but it, it, it's it's not that simple. And uh, in order to get quota transferred from NAFO, I mean that is a mini UN. And I think it, it would be easier to, you know, it's an act of God would be easier than transferring that quota. It's not that it hasn't been talked about. It's that the process itself um, is, is NAFO is impossible to decide what color this piece of, piece of paper is. Anybody that's been to a NAFO meeting knows you got to, it takes you two days to decide whether that's white. Transferring quota from one international body to, a, to one state is uh in my opinion it's a fool's errand so i'll leave it at that all right eric thank you and good luck on your reappointment to that group <laughs> hopefully nobody on the committee's listening <laughs> yeah well the, the meetings in, in a, about a month and a half and i haven't been reappointed yet so i'm i'm happy to come here it's a much easier plane ride that's great thank you Okay, so seeing no um, other hands around the table, no one else from the audience, we have a motion for preliminary specifications for LX for 2023. Uh, there's numbers in this one, Peter. Are you going to be okay with it? <laughs> if, if so, go ahead. I, I am. And maybe you should have let me read that other motion into the record. The other presenter would have been available by then. Um, I move that for the 2023 ELEC specifications, ABC equal 40,000 metric tons, IOY equal DAH equal DAP equal 38,156 metric tons. That is um, not a committee motion. It would require a second. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Do I have a second for that motion? Michelle Duvall seconds the motion. Anything to add, Peter or Michelle? Please, no, okay. Is there any discussion on the motion? Is there any council discussion? 
there any public discussion, public comment? Seeing none, back to the council. Is there any objection to the motion? Seeing no objection, were there any abstentions? No abstentions, motion parry, uh, carries by unanimous consent. Thank you all very much. I believe that's all we have under that item on the agenda. Is that correct, Jason? Yes, and our next presenter is available. Okay, let's take a few minutes break and we'll get set up for that. Um, so let's come back at 2.40. We'll take five minutes, um, come back and kick off the rest of our afternoon. Thanks. Hi, Dorit, do you just want to confirm your audio? Yes, how am I sounding right now? Excellent, thank you. Great.
All right, this is a two minute warning, everyone. We're gonna come back and get started in two minutes. Start to take your seats. Okay, welcome back everyone from that short break. I'd like to start up our afternoon agenda. So our, the first item that we're gonna take up, uh, we delayed uh, due to timing issues with our presenters. And so we're gonna go, we just finished up the preliminary 2023 specifications for ILEX. So we're gonna go back on our agenda to the 2.30 time slot. Um, where we're gonna receive a report on, on the ILEX squid uh, research track assessment process. We have Dorit with uh, CBI or the Consensus Building Institute with us uh, to provide that report. And welcome Dorit, I'm glad you're able to be with us this afternoon and we're looking forward to your report. So whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dorit. I'm a senior associate with the Consensus Building Institute. I'm glad to be here to present our review of the ILEX research track assessment. Um, so CBI was brought in by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council to conduct an evaluation of the ILEX research track assessment, essentially to ascertain the nature of the challenges faced by the ILEX RTA working group and also to provide recommendations to improve for future working groups. Um, next slide. So today we're going to be walking through the following topics. We'll begin with some background on the research track assessment goals and outcomes. We'll talk a little bit about CBI's involvement in the process. We'll walk through our findings and finally our recommendations. Next slide, please. Thank you. While the initial kickoff meeting for the research track assessment was in January 2021, the RTA actually commenced in March of 2021. It was assembled by the National Marine Fisheries Services Northeast Fisheries Science Center, and it met frequently into 2022 to discuss data, concepts, modeling results, and research recommendations for the ILEX stock assessment. All meetings were virtual due to COVID. Next slide, please. The general goals of the RTA process were to generate new research products that could either be used in the ILEX stock assessment or to inform the assessment and to prepare a stock assessment report for external peer review. And while the working group produced models and findings, the process did not unfold as expected because of challenges, including non-federal working group members access to federal data, the complexity of assessing the species in question and longstanding disagreement about which models and tools were appropriate and what data and how much is available or necessary. Disagreement about the assessment working group process and the roles of participants. Interpersonal obstacles and group dynamics and tax performance issues. These challenges hindered both research progress and consensus building. Next slide, please. The Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, in consultation with the NEFSC, initially contracted with CBI to facilitate the working group because of the challenges that became apparent during the research track assessment. This contract was then extended to undertake an evaluation of the ILEX research track assessment to ascertain the nature of the challenges faced by the working group and to provide recommendations to improve future working groups. So 
please note a couple of caveats to the evaluation. Um, one is that CBI facilitated the group. So CBI brings its experience and observations, but then also potentially its own biases into the evaluation. Next slide, please. CBI was not tasked to evaluate management or personnel, although these factors affected the operation of the working group conducting in conducting the research track assessment. This evaluation is also not intended to evaluate the full administrative record, nor be an exhaustive accounting of all elements, emails, memos, and documents that the process generated. The evaluation process was mainly based on interviews, which I'll describe in, in a moment. Um, and they were based solely on the assessment of the research track assessment for ILEX, not any other RTAs. And therefore, it is unknown whether the recommendations that we're providing here would apply to RTAs overall. Last, all errors and all omissions are the sole responsibility of CBI. Next slide, please. We, oh, you're up. Thank you. We've conducted 16 one hour long virtual interviews with stakeholders in April 2022. Interviewees were primarily working group members, but also included stock assessment process personnel and industry representatives who had attended and participated in working group meetings. Interviewees were told that their statements would remain anonymous and that they should speak freely. The interviews were conducted by two CBI facilitators, uh, one who had been brought into the working group to facilitate meetings in the fall of 2021, and the other, and that was me, who possessed no prior first-hand knowledge of the process or people involved, which hopefully provided for a fresh and outside perspective on the findings. Our findings are primarily based on these interviews, but they also consider our observations uh, from my colleague, who was the facilitator of the research track assessment work group. Next slide, please. So, to begin with the findings, I'd like to highlight some of the accomplishments. There were strides made around learning about aging and sequence of cohorts and understanding species growth. There are two methods also were discovered or used for assessing the stock and they were advanced, I guess I should say, rather than discovered. Also initial testing of a generalized depletion model that considered ingress and egress. Um, took place. An alternative CPUE model with economic factors was completed. Exploratory work around the species and oceanographic and environmental factors was advanced, um, and this holds promise for future research. More research does remain to be done um, in these areas. And finally, the work group chair, working under very difficult circumstances, was able to bring the group to consensus on several issues. Now I'd like to walk through some of the challenges. Overall, interviewees suggested that there were not as many successes in terms of research gains as would have been expected, considering the scope and purpose of the RTA process. CBI understands that ILEX is a difficult species to assess due to its ephemeral presence on and off the shelf, its short and complex life history, and because most assessment models have been built for finfish. Also, it appears that over the years, ILEX has not drawn more resources or attention when compared to traditionally high value species like scallops or depleted stocks like some ground fish. Next slide. One of the key challenges was access to data. Several working group members who were not employed with the NEFSC faced obstacles at the outset in assessing federal data sets because they needed to wait on security clearances to meet federal data release requirements to the public. This prevented work group members from conducting research in a timely manner. Also, unequal data access among working group members contributed to a perceived dynamic that certain scientists were holding on to key data to prevent other scientists from being able to contribute to advancing research. Next slide. Another key challenge was the development of the terms of reference, TORs. The development of TORs is an NRCC iterative process. To begin the RTA, key staff from the NEFSC drafted terms of reference. They were then reviewed and approved by the NRCC as well as the MAFMC in September 2020. After the TORs were finalized, some members of the public contended that there should have been additional TOR for ecosystem considerations. However, because the TORs had already been finalized, it proved quite challenging to add a new TOR later in the process. The history of the TORs and how they were developed remains contested, I should say that. Next slide. I want to add that 
industry raised TOR concerns in an email to the CBI facilitator on March 4th, 2022, that had been previously raised in 2020. And I want to highlight them here. Uh, one is that there was a refusal to pursue an explicit ecosystem based term of reference for a stock whose distribution and productivity are thought to be primarily environmentally driven. And two, that the TORs were edited and debated in a manner such that the final results were created more out of frustration than through an open and deliberative process, which concerned industry specifically because the pursuit of data needs activities discussed in TOR, which would require strong and healthy industry slash science collaboration. So um, there, there's more also included in those emails, but I just wanted to highlight these two points now. The difficulty in adding that additional TOR frustrated members of the public, uh, primarily industry representatives who felt that ecosystem considerations were essential. And the long and somewhat adversarial process regarding that TOR issue and adding that specific TOR contributed to the sense of antipathy with the process and lack of transparency. Next slide, please. Another challenge was delay. There were many delays throughout the process, which meant that the primary generalized depletion model, the GDM, was not run until quite late, and therefore the RTA did not provide much breathing room before review or before managers needed upcoming quota advice. Delays were due to lack of data access, as we already discussed, the barrier for one working group affiliate to enter the United States due to COVID restrictions, um, and that caused the assessment lead to have to conduct portions of this person's work as well as their own stock assessment work. There were also performance issues on specific tasks. There was debate around the applicability of the Falklands fishery and lack of effective constructive collaboration between working group members throughout the process. I do also want to note before moving on to the next slide that the working group had to work under the difficult and unusual conditions of COVID uh, and the stresses the pandemic put on people's personal and professional lives uh, were not insignificant. And then also dis distance engagement, having all of the meetings conducted over Zoom uh, are, are all particularly challenging for a contentious fishery. However, a commenter no noted that all other RTAs were able to proceed remotely with less difficulty. Next slide, please. Another challenge was around work plans, milestones, and agenda setting. Some interviewees expressed frustration that there was not a clear work plan, even in later stages of the process, and that there were not milestones set and accountability if, when they were missed. Also, some interviewees stated that agendas lacked clear, specific, timed topics and objectives. Some recalled that work plans, milestones, and agendas were set at the outset, but that they became diluted and less clear as some working group members vied for oversight and management, which created an atmosphere of too many cooks in the kitchen. Many stated that the process seemed amorphous, with limited expectations setting at the outset or later as time went on around how the group would be moving from beginning to end. Next slide, please. The composition of the working group and group dynamics proved to be another challenge. The working group composition was challenging in that some work group members had long and conflicted histories of working with one another in the past. And the members of the group were assigned with full knowledge of these difficult past working relationships. The work group chair and lead scientists were regularly challenged by other members of the work group and by members of the public. This contributed to a tense environment that discouraged participation by some. As a result of suboptimal group dynamics, a few working group members tended to dominate the discussion as well as the discord. And this resulted in several working group members remaining largely quiet, passive participants throughout the process, which meant that working group did not reap the full benefit of the multidisciplinary team that was the working group membership. Next slide, please. Composition of the working group, just a little bit more on that. Some noted that the interest of some individuals in pursuing publishing as an outcome, as well as development of technology not directly relevant to the TORs seemed to potentially take away from the primary focus of the working group. Some stated that some members of the working group repeated and second guessed others work with the intended goal of reaching a higher quota for the fishery. Others noted that they did not believe all members stated facts clearly, accurately, or consistently. Next slide. 
The working group had numerous skilled and able members. However, it was missing certain kinds of expertise shared among multiple members, including additional species expertise and more modeling experience when compared to other working groups. That posed several challenges. Only a smaller subset of the working group can engage deeply in model development and evaluation due to the complexities of stock assessment modeling, especially methods considered in this particular working group. Because there was only one lead scientist with substantial LS experience, that scientist was often placed in the crosshairs of debate about the features and nature of the species. This in turn led to contentious discussions, lack of trust, and the inability of the group to have expertise be derived from at least a few rather than one person. Next slide, please. So due to all of the challenges I've just outlined, uh, the group struggled with collaboration and in full working group meetings to accomplish tasks. As a result, individual members formed smaller cohorts to get the work done. And you know, this included the oceanographic work, the aging and sampling of ILEX, the standardization of the CPUE model with economic factors, and the development and advancement of the models and tools under consideration. While these smaller groups were successful in advancing their work, and some of this smaller group work was likely necessary, that sort of stovepiped, if you will, approach inhibited further collaboration, and it also inhibited more working group members from contributing meaningfully. It likely led to missed opportunities to collectively advance a better understanding of this complex species. Furthermore, some noted that participant offers to collaborate on some of the smaller working group topics were not always acknowledged or accommodated. Next slide. Industry involvement. Industry interviewees noted that collaborative involvement in previous stock assessments was more productive and lacked the contention of the ILEX RTA. Perhaps the combination of lacking clear procedures governing public participation in the working group and an unusually high degree of interest on the part of the industry to be involved in the RTA led to that excessive contention and difficulty. Industry interviewees noted that collaborative involvement in previous stock assessments was much more productive and lacked that level of contention. And this could be because public comment rules and expectations were not clearly established. Um, and at times, industry felt shut out or not listened to. And at the same time, at times, members of the working group felt that the industry exchange was hostile, interrogating, and did not advance the science, but rather sought to protect or advance their economic interests. Next slide, please. So I'm going to move into some of the recommendations that we've outlined, uh, and there are. So, so I'll begin with group composition and management clarity. So the composition of the working group is one of the most important factors controlling whether the working group can produce a successful stock assessment product that is accepted by the assessment review panel. In light of that. CBI recommends that leadership more carefully consider the combination of personalities, interests, and skill sets of members when evaluating applicants for positions on the working group. In addition, leadership should make the hard decisions early about who is on a work group and who is not. Leadership should pay close attention not only to individual skill sets, but also to how the work group as a whole entity is likely to function in a group process. Members must possess the requisite technical and process skills to be able to contribute successfully to the RTA, which demands an ability to be collaborative, interdisciplinary, and to work in larger groups with industry engagement. Where possible, there should be more than one species expert in the work group to increase the spirit of collaboration and sources of knowledge. For that same reason, there should either be more modelers in the working group than was the case with this RTA or meaningful pre-work group training for all work group members to better understand the relevant statistical approaches. Essentially, there should be enough diversity of skill sets so that no one individual is holding too much of the responsibility to perform work on their own, which it turns out was the case with this research track assessment. Without these pertinent skill sets on the work group, an RTA seems unlikely to be successful, regardless of how much generalized scientific knowledge or collaboration exists on the team. Next slide, please. Terms of reference development. There should be an opportunity for work group members and the public to comment on and influence TORs at the earliest stage of the RTA. CBI evaluators recognize and commend that the NEFSC has developed generic TORs in part to avoid past problems 
and a work group can now petition the NRCC for a change in the TORs. We CEI evaluators do suggest that the RTA include additional TOR development steps. This could be achieved through a multi-stakeholder workshop prior to launching an RTA where experts in industry are invited to discuss the stock assessment challenges and opportunities and either develop or respond to a draft set of TORs. The NEFSC may then refine and hone the TORs. After approval, the species-specific TORs built from the generic ones could be posted for a public comment period of two weeks before being finalized and reapproved for NRCC for use at the RTA. The TORs could, they could then be reviewed by the species advisory panel prior to moving ahead with both management track and research track assessments to reduce the potential for conflict and misunderstanding with the industry going forward. Next slide. Streamline data clearance and access. Because the data access proved to be such a challenge, we recommend that after applicants have been selected for the working group, all prospective work group members should be placed through a streamlined clearance process to enable all members to access all potentially relevant data during an RTA. This clearance process should take place before the first meeting of the working group. We, the CBI evaluators, recognize the importance of protecting confidential data as required by law and to the protection of individual businesses and boats. Yet at the same time, without access to relevant fisheries independent and dependent data, a workgroup cannot successfully accomplish its tasks. All workgroup members should have equal access to data through the RTA. Ideally, any data that are not accessible directly by all workgroup members should not be considered or used in the stock assessment. This would enable efficiency, collaboration, and optimal advancement of research. It's important for maintaining transparency and an equal opportunity par to participate in the research process for all workgroup members. However, we at the, as CBI evaluators do recognize that there are ongoing legal hurdles to making data more accessible to non-federal workgroup members. Preferably, once the RTA is commenced, if it is discovered that additional data that was not previously cleared for access is necessary, workgroup members with access should wait to commence work until that additional clearance is granted, find ways to track the work so that others can follow it once their access is available, or find ways to work that instills credibility and trust with others who don't have current access to data. For instance, depending on the specificity of data needed, a workgroup may be able to use the NEFSC staff as proxies to undertake some work in a trusted fashion considering these constraints. Because the, this waiting for access was a major cause for delay during the ILEX working group process, perhaps proceeding with data treated for confidentiality for preliminary analysis could keep the process moving while waiting for universal clearance for the more detailed data sets. The NEFSC should put in place or clarify and communicate and or enforce internal protocols that make clear that NEFSC data, however developed, does not belong to any one individual or group of researchers. Next slide, please. Planning process and communication around norms and group procedures. A clear timeline with milestones along the way should be presented at an initial workgroup meeting by the workgroup chairperson. This timeline, of course, will need to be reevaluated over the course of the RTA. However, beginning with the intended goals and sequencing of milestones is crucial for workgroup members to know what is expected of them so that they can perform to the best of their abilities. While the TOR is the core guiding document of any workgroup, the TORs alone are not a process map. The NEFSC should develop means and tools to help chairs and workgroup members map these TORs onto process plans and meeting agendas. If original research is an objective of the RTA, the timeline must consider the requisite time required to accomplish these elements of the work. Because original research can be unpredictable, care should be taken in tying original research to RTAs. In other words, the RTA operational period should consider the length of time required to complete the planned research products. Meeting agendas ideally should be distributed prior to each meeting and meeting summaries, as mostly did occur with this work group, should be distributed after each meeting in addition to shared files. And this is important for work group members who must miss meetings, as well as for concretizing in institutional memory what took place during the previous work group meetings. Communication norms should be presented to the work group at the outset of the process and enforced. It should be made clear that personal attacks and disrespectful language and tone will not be tolerated in the working group. This can be achieved by naming undesirable behavior, ending meetings early, speaking with individuals between meetings, 
and other methods as well. There should be a commitment to shared education and a prioritization of hearing from a diversity of viewpoints. Leadership should support the working group in achieving these norms, including stepping in to adjust course as needed. The first working group meeting should involve the division chief or other leadership to clearly lay out expectations for all in both substance and process. Uh, next slide, please. Roles should be clarified early on so that all working group members are clear on who is the primary decision maker as well as on how to best deliver input in the process. The roles of both the chairperson as well as the assessment leave must be made clear to working group members from the start. Clarity around roles will enable further collaboration, knowledge sharing, and flexible thinking. How decisions are made in working groups and what happens if agreement is not reached should be described in detail in writing and should be shared with working group members. This ideally would include clarity around the role played by the work group chair if there is an impasse. Is that, that person the decider, the broker? Will they elevate it to le other leadership, et cetera? Also, it should be very clear how disagreement should be communicated to other bodies and what the obligation is of the NEFFC staff to reflect the will of the group, even if they are uncomfortable with the results and then sharing out the results. Next slide, please. Oh, excuse me, actually, can you go back one? So the, a note about sort of the, the work group leadership, which is that the work group chair has a difficult and sometimes thankless job of organizing the agendas, running the meetings, managing group dynamics, project management to ensure progress is made, undertaking some of the technical work, and helping draft and oversee various reports and final products. The ILIX chair was able to help the group reach conclusion through assuming many of these roles, as well as drafting the majority of the final report and deserves credit for doing so under quite difficult circumstances. We, the CBI evaluators, encourage the NEFSE to think about ways to ensure that the chair can be successful on behalf of the group and have the support that the chair needs in order to be successful. Research track assessment work groups require strong technical project manage technical project management and facilitation skills, all three, and the NEFSC could include providing additional training for NEFSC staff, uh, meaning developing a particular facilitation skill set within the NEFSC staff, or from time to time if needed, as was done for this effort, bringing in an outside facilitator. Um, it should be noted that we indeed found stock assessment to be a complicated endeavor. So some reasonable measure of stock assessment, fisheries, and modeling is uh, likely necessary for anyone playing the facilitative role uh, in order for it to be effective. We would encourage the NEFSC to build internal facilitative capacity first and foremost, if possible. Next slide, please. Rules for industry participation. Industry is an essential stakeholder in stock assessments in that they engage with the ocean and the species day to day and year to year. They're potentially directly affected by conclusions drawn from assessments and industry also collects reports and holds enormous amounts of data information. As an example, industry had provided individual length and size data for many years to the stock assessor and began to provide this information electronically directly into the Science Center recently. Because RTAs lead ultimately to management decisions through the management track assessments, industry is economically exposed to the implications of the RTA. Therefore, the RTA must balance industry and perhaps other stakeholder involvement with rigorous independent science. We, the CBI evaluators, suggest that industry have a meaningful role in helping shape TORs, providing and analyzing data, and questioning and debating models, choices, and conclusions. At the same time, if industry wishes to be part of the process, the industry, of course, bears certain responsibilities. Industry representatives should respect the scientific process and the technical skill sets needed to advance assessment and should also follow the same ground rules as the work group members of listening, engaging in respectful dialogue, and avoiding personal attacks. Next slide, please. For the RTA to achieve its intended goal, there should be sufficient time for brainstorming, experimentation, making mistakes, and returning to the drawing board. Science rarely takes a straight and linear path, 
and performing under unrealistic time pressure without sufficient resources or data reduces the ability to think creatively and flexibly. Thus, we the CBI evaluators encourage the NEFSC to think about further ways to separate out and sequence the management track assessments from the research track assessments. Whether that's achieved by deciding that RTA findings cannot be used until the following year, or that the management track considerations must be separated by at least six months or by some other means, we don't know. But we encourage the NEFSC and management partners to explore this further. Thank you. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions or if it makes more sense for there to be a roundtable discussion at this stage, uh, whatever makes the most sense for this group. Thanks so much for your time. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I want to see if maybe the Science Center has anything they'd like to say. Um, not sure. John, I saw John. Oh, there he goes. Uh, John's hand came up. Go ahead, John. I thought I'd provide an opportunity for you if you had uh, any follow up to the presentation and then. We can go around the table and get some thoughts and comments and questions. No, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and you know, thank you, Dorit and CBI, for um, coming in and helping facilitate this research track assessment to to help sort of get it to completion, and then um, for doing this, you know, sort of uh, after action review. Um, you know, the recommendations are are very helpful. Um, and we intend to use this to help improve the research track assessment process. Um, we have been making progress on, on some of the issues that have been raised, the federal data, uh, working on improving access to it for all working group members, um, and the TORs, as, as you mentioned uh, uh, during your presentation, you know, there's uh, generic TORs that can then be adjusted by the, by the working group. Um, and I, you know, I think, Part of our, you know, supporting the Mid Atlantic Council and doing this was um, to help us improve the processes that we are using together. Um, and so, you know, this this report identifies a number of areas for improvement, um, and the Northeast Fisheries Science Center will work with the Northeast Regional uh, Coordinating Council to make these improvements in. Our stock assessment process. So, um, you know, I also appreciate you uh, saying that you know many of the other research track assessments, quote unquote, um, have gone better than this one. So, you know, reviewing the the ELEX research track assessment is very helpful for us to learn how to improve the process overall. So that that's all I have to say, Mr. Chair, and thank you for for taking the time to to let me speak. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, and while I will say that, you know, there's always room for improvement in everything that we do, you know, I, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned about the way that this process unfolded. I mean, the, it, it seemed like it was absolute chaos. I did not participate in much of it, but it, it was more of a circus than it was um, a productive way to, you know, collaborate on on this on this assessment process and i hope that the recommendations coming forward as presented today or will be taken into consideration seriously for for further improvement because it seems to me that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make this process better uh, in the future so i will stop there and see if there are any comments anybody have any questions about what was presented to us uh, and there will be an opportunity for the public to um, offer thoughts as well before we wrap things up. And we'll, I'll start with Michelle Duvall and then Dewey, you'll be next. Go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. And so, um, you know, just it's pretty eye opening reading, reading this report. You know, I've not. Um, more to you. I, I've listened in to one of the uh, one of the presentations. I think that was you know towards the end of this particular research track assessment. So I wasn't wasn't um, participating or or sorry, rather listening to you know previous meetings. But in just looking through 
the existing NRCC process and the documentation for the development of tours for the research track assessment. There are some generic um, research track terms of reference that are that are noted in sort of the revised NRCC process. And um, you know, I know that the uh, SSC chairs, I believe, from both the Mid Atlantic and the New England Fishery Management Councils are part of the NRCC. Is is that correct? And so, you know, I'm wondering if part of this maybe improvements to the terms of reference process might be um, to more fully include, you know, the SSCs as well in review of those terms of reference. Um, you know, I think that's something that is is done in other regions to provide additional feedback as well as, um, you know, you by the working group, you know, once that working group is established. So just trying to think about other ways to potentially improve that since the development of the terms of reference was clearly um, something that caused some consternation and it sounds like, you know, there's never not a real um, firm uh, county of how, how that actually unfolded. or I guess they're differing, differing um, recollections of how that process unfolded. So just something to offer up there and I'm sure others have others, but as someone who hasn't, you know, been through this process a lot, I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. No, thanks for that. And uh, Dr. Rago is online with us and Brandon is, is listening in as well. So we can certainly take that into consideration. Um, and if this comes up at the NRCC, uh, you know, it's something we can also discuss there to try to make this process better. Uh, Dewey Hemmelwright is next. And then Eric, I'll come down to you. Dewey, go ahead. I just got one simple question. How many folks was on this uh, working group that was comprised of how many people? I'm not going to ask for names, but just the working group of how many individuals would make up this working group. Jason, can you provide that or Dorit? Yeah, I'm just pulling up the working group page right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We had nine folks. Basically, when it's referring to uh, in here, the working group is nine people. Thank you. Yeah, the working group is represented by those nine individuals, but there was a lot of other um, participation from others that weren't on the working group and I think that's where some of the I um uh, it has nothing to do with with this uh research track assessment but the terms of references is something that I learned last week from the South Atlanta Council when they were having review for Spanish mackerel I was asked where the term of references that they had had come from, and it was the council, the SSC, and the Science Center, you know, particularly down there how it's made up, because it, it seems like, and my limited knowledge of this, which is very limited, it, it seemed like them terms of references and how they're uh, referenced out there is very important, and you have to have the council, the SSC, as Michelle was saying, possibly, and the science center all together for them terms of references, because particularly in the South Atlantic, I saw where the terms of references that were asked, uh, the data was too deficient for the terms of references. And so that just, with this here, just that, that's very important, but uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dewey. Uh, Eric Reed. You want to go to Dr. Hare before me? I can. I just saw his name when I said yours. So, uh, Dr. Hare, are you there? I, I defer to Mr. Reed. I can speak after him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, Mr. Chair. I didn't. I wasn't thinking it was a circus at all. I thought it was more like a horror show. To be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> So, I mean, 
I agree with a lot of the points in, in the, the CBI report. And um, I want to make sure that these recommendations are not considered but implemented. And, you know, exactly what is the role of the NRCC in doing that? I, you know, Dr. Moore's probably got a better handle on it than I do, and, and I, but I, I'd just like to get some idea of what ability the NRCC has to solve some of these really glaring problems. Um, you know, the recommendation to do the TORs as early as possible and to involve the public is, is, a, is a good one because that's, I mean, let's face it, you know, that one of the lines in the reports, which I, I'm not sure how to, how to deal with it is that the unusually high degree of interest by the industry led to a basic to excessive contention. Um, when you got a species like Ilex, which it's a, it, it's, it's a data poor species, we don't know a lot about it. Scientists don't know a lot about it. But I got to tell you what, on a species like that, I want the industry in the room because they know a hell of a lot more about it than anybody. So that, that particular comment, I, I, I take exception to that um, because of that. You know, the industry was engaged, and there's a line in the report that says, you know, maybe some of the information was skewed because it, uh, in order to uh, possibly attain a higher quota. That, that, in my mind, is incorrect. And I listened to almost every meeting, and I don't think I commented on one because it wasn't my place. Uh, but the industry was well represented, and, you know, they've been providing, I used to be part of that industry, uh, we've been providing data forever on ILEX. Size, length, we've asked repeatedly over the years, what data do you want? What format do you want it in? So we can get it to groups like this and make their life easier and give them all the data they want. And, and honestly, when it, when it started, whenever it was in January, started in January more or less, um, you know, the thing about whether well, there weren't clear objectives. The first meeting, okay, the end of the first meeting. For the second meeting, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. You go to the second meeting, didn't get done. Third meeting, the first meeting stuff didn't get done. That carried through, I mean, I don't even know if, if the stuff got done by the end. But when you're 12 and a half months in, and all of a sudden, the statement is made, well, yeah, the model that we're... We, we were going to use, we can't use it because we don't have the data. I mean, I, <laughs> I almost fell off my chair and that would have been the only sound in that entire, on that entire call because it was shocking. Uh, but it, it's, it's uh, you know, the Alex is done. We've got this report. Science Center is mentioned many times in making improvements. The NRCC has to be involved. And I want to know where, when and where that can happen. Because I don't want this to happen again. And if somebody could remind me when we're going to have this exercise for LALAGO, all these things have to be ready to go before we even go down that road. That, that's, that's what I want. So there you have it, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, I'll go to John first. And then if he doesn't address some of your questions, uh, I, I can try to provide, I think, <laughs> You know we have an uh, NRCC meeting planned in October. That yeah, we can have I'm, this I'm actually the chair of that, Mike, so I, I know I know about it. But I, the, the process is something that would you know somebody's got to help me with that. I understand. Let's go to John and see if uh, if he has anything to add. Go ahead, John. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, the stock assessment process is the. Northeast Regional Coordinating Council process. Um, and so, you know, we fully intend that this report um, be on the agenda for our fall, our, the NRCC fall meeting. Um, and, you know, we have already been working, the NRCC has already been working to make improvements on a number of these issues that were raised. Um, you know, we, we identified them before the report, and the report is very helpful because it it sort of identifies that these are the issues we need to work on. 
Um, and so, you know, we will review this, you know, at the upcoming NRCC meeting, um, we can review progress made to date on uh, the recommendations. And then as a group, um, we can uh, determine how we're going to make additional progress on these recommendations. And so I think the next com you know, it's excellent to have this conversation here at the Mid Atlantic Council to hear um, people's response and questions about the report. And then we plan to you know, have this conversation more focused at that NRCC meeting. All right, thanks, John. <clears throat> Excuse me. Michelle Duvall. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just just one more thing on the terms of reference, just because our briefing materials included some of the communication back and forth, I think, from industry uh, with respect to an ecosystem term of reference. And so, you know, again, just looking at the documentation that's on the NRCC website about the revised process and research track ter assessment terms of reference and sort of the um, you know, how they will be developed individually, but the generic terms of reference are, and so there's, you know, half a dozen or so. And the first one is identify relevant ecosystem and climate influences on the stock, yet, you know, that wasn't in the final terms of reference, just going back and looking at some of the documentation um, from the SSC's, you know, previous meeting where they were reviewing the ELEX assessment. So, you know, it seems like there was a bit of a disconnect there specifically you know, because this is something that is, you know, part of the documented generic terms of reference. You know, this was a specific request from industry to consider it. I think it's, you know, given, um, you know, all of the different changes that we're seeing uh, on the water and, you know, with our managed species and, you know, our earlier conversation today about climate change scenario planning that, you know, inclusion of that would have been a very, very useful thing. So, you know, perhaps that can be part of the NRCC discussion when this report goes through there to to see if any of that needs to be modified or updated. Yes, thank you very much for that, Michelle. Anyone else from the council? Okay, seeing none at this time, is there anyone from the public that would like to address the council on uh, regarding the uh, presentation that we received. See two hands in the audience and one online. We'll start with Greg DiDomenico, and then I'll go to Megan Lapp and then Jeff Kalin. So we'll start with Greg. Greg DiDomenico, Lunds Fisheries. Um, I'll be as brief as possible on what is a very important topic. Uh, but first, I uh, wanted to make sure I thanked council leadership and the council for uh, intervening in this particular process by engaging with CBI. I believe that um, the facilitator brought about uh, not only the suggestions uh, that you see here today, but probably uh, brought about. Um, the best that this assessment could have possibly produced under the circumstances. Um, I wanted to just make a comment. Um, I wanted to also tell you what my goal is, was. Um, I had a request, which I think has been sufficiently answered, but I'll go over that one as well. And then I want to make one specific complaint about part of the report. So I'll start with my goal. My goal, uh, and quite frankly, was the goal of six or seven other industry representatives from the three major companies involved in this fishery. We've been working on this issue for years. This is just the culmination of the assessment. But our involvement in this process and the data, and quite frankly, our complaints and criticisms of this process have been ongoing for a very long time. Throughout this process, 
the industry probably um, spoke once a week, if not daily, for about 12 months and produced, um, after lengthy discussion and debate, most of the materials that you saw, that you saw in the briefing materials that clearly articulate our complaints that, have la that, that, that really started over a year ago. So this was a lot of work. Um, I hope it's worth it. It has been so far, but my goal is that we never, no one on any species or from any stakeholder group has to ever fight this hard for this long for best available science. And I know that this is what the Mid-Atlantic Council is all about, and I hope that everyone has the exact same intentions uh, when it comes to implementing these, because the only thing that matters is that you that that um, when the dust settles, that strict methodologies produce the best available science. So that's my goal. I hope we get there. Uh, my request, which I think has already been um, achieved, is that the NRCC takes this, uh, puts it puts it on their agenda, and make sure that these are followed. And, and discussed and considered and hopefully implemented for the future. Um, I want to get to my complaint, my specific complaint. If Dorit could go back to her presentation um, regarding the issue of the composition of the working group and group dynamics. It's page six. It's the second paragraph of the report, but I, it's summarized briefly in Dorit's presentation, but let me read it. It says that some noted that the interest of some individuals in pursuing publishing as an outcome, as well as the development of technology, not directly relevant to the TORs, seem to potentially take away from the primary focus of the working group. Some stated that some members of the working group repeated and second-guessed others' work with the intended goal of reaching a higher quota for the fishery. Some interviewees noted that they did not believe all members, now they're saying working group members, some interviewees noted that they did not believe all members stated facts clearly, accurately, or consistently. Now, this implies that the interviewee is clairvoyant, number one. It also implies, and quite frankly, I think it impugns the reputation, the scientific reputation of the people on the working group. I think I know who this in interviewees are talking about. And I would say that it's absolutely inappropriate and it's misplaced and it's unfounded. Um, this is the very reason that the industry documented its complaints for over a year, of course, which are in the briefing materials. Um, the last thing I want to say, and it's specific to this complaint in the paragraph I read, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. If somebody involved in this process wants to make that accusation against me, guilty. But if we're going to have an assessment process that doesn't allow for lively debate, dissent, and quite frankly, some disagreements, with other people, then I don't think we're gonna get best available science. So I caution, and I would ask for that, that everyone to really read that paragraph. So again, I'll repeat, um, guilty, I wanted a larger quota. That's what we're looking for. And I don't think I'm alone, and I don't think I'm alone um, not only with my colleagues, but quite frankly, um, with many people associated in fisheries management, people do want larger quotas. This one happens to be, quite frankly, justified and 
also it's about time. So just leave you with that complaint. Um, as far as comments being anonymous, anybody who wants to talk to me about this topic, I'm an open book. I'll tell you exactly what I meant and what I said and what those documents mean. And um, again, I hope it does produce best available science. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Greg. Thank you for your comment. Megan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Megan Lab Seafreeze. Um, yeah, I'd like to echo a lot of what Greg said as well as what Eric said, but I think it's important for people around the table to really understand um, where industry is coming from, particularly the industry that was involved in this assessment process. Um, and, and I do want to thank the council for involving CBI um, because I think it, it was very, very necessary in this particular assessment. Um, but just as a little bit of backstory, um, for those of us who were involved in this research track assessment, this is not our first rodeo. Um, earlier on in the CBI presentation, and I understand that CBI is trying to um, present the viewpoints of all the interviewees to the council, but there was a line that said that um, people felt that the industry was hostile and only in this for economic advantage. Um, neither of those statements were true. Did we get frustrated? Yes. Um, are we in it only for economic advantage? No. Are we? Yes, but we're also in this for very good science, and that's what we were really trying to produce here. Um, before this, the ELEX assessment, um, both um, Lunds, Seafreeze, and others were involved in the mackerel benchmark assessment. For years, the there was not an accepted assessment, and quite frankly, the quotas were too high. And we wanted assess an assessment that was going to be accepted by peer reviewers and also show what the state of the stock was. We worked collaboratively with scientists, regulators, and administrators prior to the assessment. We held mackerel summits, is what we called them. We got everybody together with the industry in a room. We shared industry knowledge. and. We collaborated with the lead assessment scientists to produce an assessment that was accepted by peer review. And the result of that assessment was that it showed that the mackerel biomass was much, much lower and had been much lower than what the previous um, advice had been. And even though, yeah, that hurt us because we got quotas slashed, we were happy about it because it showed what the reality of the stock was. It showed the actual. Um, the science mirrored reality, and that's what we were getting at, and that's what we were trying to get out with this stock assessment as well. Um, in this particular assessment, we held an ELEC summit in 2019 in preparation for it. We invited um, scientists, oceanographers, administrators, regulators, and with the intent of trying to replicate mackerel, let's get a stock assessment that is accepted by peer review, and we will put our money where our mouth is to try to bring people together to share data to get this done. Um, Seafreeze itself has shared proprietary company grading data with the Science Center for over 20 years in an attempt to try to make science for ELEX better. Um, however, this stock assessment process, suffice it to say that there has never been a stock assessment process in the history of stock assessments, as far as I am aware, that required a third party facilitator. Um, I'm very glad that the council and the Science Center hired a third party facilitator because otherwise I don't think it would have gotten done because nine months into the assessment, we still didn't even have a work plan. Um, however, I think that that in itself is telling. And, you know, I would suggest that the recommendations prepared by CBI go to the NRCC, that the NRCC develop some guidelines. And I would also request that there be, um, that the NRCC um, deliberate on how assessment reports are reviewed by the working group. Um, because one shortfall that I did see in this process was that because there was a mediator trying to get people to agree on things, consensus, and move things through, 
um, there were there was certain key language taken out of the final report um, because one individual um, just simply would not agree with the majority of the other working group members. Several other working group members wanted language, scientific language, to remain in the report. One working group member um, did not, and eventually everybody else said, this isn't a hill we're willing to die on. Let's move forward. And to me, that's not good science. So I would like to see the NRCC review these recommendations and develop um, some guidelines for the process. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Watch yourself there. Um, I saw Jeff's hand up earlier. Jeff, are you still with us? Did you want to provide any comment? I see your hand went uh, down. I just want to yeah, make thank, sure. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, it's Jeff Kalin uh, with Lunds in Cape May. Uh, my son had a 40th birthday party in Maine, which is why I'm not in Philly with you all. I am home working remotely. But um, yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and Dr. Moore for engaging CBI uh, in this process. I think it brought us to, it, it, it definitely moved us ahead uh, on this issue of trying to assess a squid, um, you know, which doesn't lend itself to standard reference points like FinFish uh, does. So I, I think there was a lot of advancement in the understanding of the animal and the oceanographic factors and so forth um, that, that came out in the end. So, you know, it wasn't a complete disaster, but I, I do think that, you know, we, we were on 12 or 13 of these and, you know, uh, there's all, what all four major squid producers are now MSC certified and we're, we're under one uh, certificate now. And, uh, you know, we, we've, we've given an awful lot of time and, and uh, information for the process. So I don't know that it was a disaster, but I just wanted to thank the council and the leadership for engaging CBI. And, 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 and honestly, that group has been very, very helpful on moving some of the wind discussions uh, forward too. And I know Chris knew that when, when the council uh, moved ahead to, to engage CBI. So I, I just wanted to say that, um, I, and uh, I don't want to repeat what, what Greg said or Megan, but you know, it, it was helpful. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes from here. And um, we'll look forward to uh, another opportunity on another species um, in the future. I'll just say one thing. I have probably 12 or 14 inches of paper in a notebook on the ILEX assessment. Uh, so there was a lot of collaboration. There were some lines in the sand that really weren't able to be crossed because there were a lot of personality conflicts that were involved and and uh, but moving ahead um, you know there was some good science dr rago's work around escapement which is you know becoming recognized as an international proxy for um f and msy or or you know msy generally um you know it advanced uh, the understanding of the stock and and sharpen the science so that the uh, reviews that we have my point on on msc earlier was that we have annual reviews to keep that certification and i think we can document that there was a lot of progress made and a lot of industry involvement and collaboration uh, with the center um the council staff and so forth so so that is progress and i just kind of choose to to uh, look at it in a positive way. And again, just thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Chris for involving CBI and uh, thank you for the report also. Okay, thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> they have these things known as computers that you can store all that paper on and you don't have to have paper piled up all over your house like a hoarder, but... Um, you can't, you you doing well. can't disparage senior citizens. That's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you said you're you're celebrating your son's 40th, you you aged yourself. So <laughs> I thought I I thought I'd throw a little joke in there. For I you. appreciate that, Mike. Thanks a lot. I wish I was there with you. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, I'm gonna bring this back to the table. Um I'll turn to Kate Wilkie. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to speak up and say uh, thank you for bringing this to the council's attention. It's, it's an important and concerning topic, and I just didn't want to sit here and be silent. I want to say I hear, I, I hear the issues, and, and I sincerely hope that the, the council and, and the council coordinating committee, uh, you know, follow up and, and, and address it. And I just wanted to, to, to say I hear the situation and acknowledge that it's important. And that kind of collaborative working group to, to work through the ecology and the status of, status of a stock is really important. So it's unfortunate to hear how this process turned out and wouldn't want it to happen again in the future. Thanks. Yeah, Kate, thanks for your comment. Um, and given the fact that you're going to be a Mid-Atlantic Council member for about 20 more minutes, we'll, we'll keep that into consideration for the next 20 minutes or so. I'm still <laughs> going to be an engaged stakeholder, and I still care. You have to think about what your last words will be as you, as you do get ready to depart. So um, we'll see if anybody else around the table has anything they'd like to offer, and seeing none at this time. Durrett and uh, Jason, thank you very much for preparing for that presentation. And we'll look forward to uh, future discussions at the NRCC um, with Chairman Reed acknowledging that fact uh, and uh, reports back to the public and to the council as to what directions we're, we plan to take next. So thanks, thanks very much for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, so I think it's best if we just go ahead and forge ahead, Jason, are you prepared for the next item on the agenda? Or do you need a break? I think we're good, Stephen. You can just pull up that last presentation. Okay, Thank so you. the next item is an update on the LX permit amendment. Um, and I'm going to turn to Jason to provide that information. Whenever you're ready, Jason. So again, this is um, mostly an informational item. Um, no council action today. Uh, just going to review kind of the timeline, the intent, and then what the measures were, largely because there are a number of council members who weren't here uh, when action was taken, um, and just kind of a refresher. So uh, the council action was taken July 2020. We had a notice of availability in June 2022. Uh, in September, we're expecting a NIMS decision on approval or disapproval, um, and then if it's approved, uh, we'd see a proposed rule after that. So, you know, the council's in ge general intent with this action was to reduce excess capacity in the elix fishery, given the performance in recent years, uh, try to mitigate the rapid use of the quota that, again, we've seen early closures um, in, in a number of the most recent years. So this is just uh, a table clipped out from the press release at the time. Um, the council um, recommended a, a three-tiered system with a, a number of requalification criteria from the uh, from 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 the existing limited access permits. Um, that you know, the council was trying to balance, um, you know, still there being sufficient capacity to harvest optimum yield, but um, at the same time trying to mitigate some of these early closures that we've been experiencing. Um, so these are the measures in, in that were described in the NOA, uh, the closure, the, the uh, comments for that closed on Monday. Uh, the council did um, submit a, a comment just kind of reiterating the council's, um, you know, intent um, for, for and, and desire for implementation of, um, of the action since it had been a while. Um, so again, it would take the roughly 75 current limited access permits um, down to about 20, 35 in tier one, 13 in tier two, two in tier three, 25 would not qualify for any tier under the measures um, that, um, that, 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 again, these are you know, preliminary analyses based on uh, the data exists at the time. If um, actions like this typically have an appeals process associated, so never know exactly what the numbers are until everything shakes out, but that was, that was the estimate of, of of requalifications. Um, also, the council recommended uh, a baseline measurement and in, in, in fish hold volume upgrade restriction accompanying that. And there was a little bit of ambiguity in the regs about 
um, who had to report what when, so the council clarified um, some of the reporting requirements. Uh, so again, this would be a relatively short agenda item, perhaps depending on discussion, but we're kind of um, you know waiting to see what NIMPS uh, decides um, they're in that kind of final rulemaking uh, or, or, or approval, um, disapproval phase based on um, the, you know, the comments they get in, get in and, and their evaluation of the council's recommendation. Um, if approved, you know, council staff would um, kind of support implementation like, uh, like, like a typical amendment. If disapproved, then, um, you know, there may be some possible follow-up amendment for the council to consider um, you know, it will depend on, you know, what NIMS does, why it does what it does, um, and then what the council, you know, wants, wants to consider in the future. Um, so again, since uh, approval or disapproval was pending, um, talking uh, with Dr. Moore, it seemed uh, reasonable to kind of just review the action um, and uh, we'll see what, what, what NIMS does uh, either later this month or early September. Um, and that's it for me. I can take questions if there are any. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jason. So no no action at this time, but just questions or, or any comments for Jason. Wes Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jason, how many of the 25 that don't qualify, are any of them fishing this year or fishing last year? I'm not sure about this year, um, and also not sure about last year. There, there, there were. Um, I mean, I remember in 2020 there were, um, you know, a couple vessels who had fished recently up to that point who would not requalify. Um, I, I believe, but I'm not sure about 2021 or 2022. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Is there anyone from the public? Greg? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just brief comments. Um, Greg DiDomenico, Lunds Fisheries. I'm sure everybody recalls that we were very supportive of this amendment and um, this is, uh, This situation, um, we really hope that the agency does not reject this amendment. Um, I could go into lots of reasons why, but one, I'd like to just remind everybody, um, the agency encouraged investment in these fisheries, which have made them what they are today. Um, not just, of course, Lund's fisheries uh, has not been the only people to invest, but it's really important that the agency remembers that the votes that the, the vessels that depend on this fishery have given every, just about every other permit up. There's nothing left for them to fish for. And in fact, they're trying to make the best of that situation right now, despite the conditions and the slow fishing. They have no other choices. And quite frankly, the people who have um, been latecomers, for the lack of a better word, or have speculated in this fishery, still have many, many other permits and many other choices to make a living. I just wanted to make that, uh, just to remind everybody in public and on the record of that, and again, would hope that the agency uh, considers, considers that in their, uh, in their decision. Thank you. Appreciate that comment, Greg. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Not seeing any hands in the room. Oh, hand online. So we have Katie Almeida. Good, Katie. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, I just wanted to answer Wes's question uh, about fishing last year and this year. And I will speak on behalf of Town Dock and um, their vendors. We did fish last year. Yes, we were very active in the fishery. This year, um, because we are ice boats, remember there's a difference between these fisheries, uh, we could not travel as far down south 
to just kind of poke around and see what was going on. So we were able to con um, concentrate on Longfin at this point. So if we had Ilex further up north, like it has shown um, up these past few years, uh, we definitely would have been fishing in that. Um, but we've been concentrating on the longfin fishery right now. And since it's closed, uh, we'll start probably heading out to um, look for some more Ilex. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Megan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Megan Lapp, Sea Freeze. Um, I would just like to say that I do hope that the agency does support this amendment um, because unlike many other vessels that do have the ability to engage in other fisheries at this time of the year, our vessels were built for ELEX in the summer, only ELEX in the summer. We have fished ELEX every summer since our vessels have been built, um, including this year, and we don't have any other alternatives. So when it does shut early, we're tied to the dock. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak to this issue? Okay, seeing no one online or in the audience, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up this item on this afternoon's agenda. Thank you, Jason, for presenting that to us. Um, and we'll move on to the last item on the agenda, which is a little less formal of an item. Uh, it's one that is part of the, the annual council process, and that is to acknowledge uh, the outgoing council members um, for this current year. And this year we have one. Um, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, uh, Kate Wilkie will be leaving the council after serving uh, a term over the course of the last three years from 2019 to 2022. Uh, Kate will be leaving us and I, I would be lying to say that there haven't been times over the past 12 or 13 years that I've been on the council that I haven't dreamt of that day when somebody would be saying that to me. <laughs> but, you know, here I am still here. And as the folks around the table, like, like Joe and Chris and, and Pat, those of us who are serving as uh, administrative representatives, I don't know if those, sometimes I wonder if those days will ever come. But uh, it's, it's all good. I, we certainly enjoy it uh, as spending time doing this. So, um, but Kate, uh, we will, it, it's, you know, the council wants to certainly acknowledge the work that you've done uh, over the last three years. And so Kate has served as our Ecosystems and Ocean Planning Committee uh, Chair and the Vice Chair of our River Herring and Shad Committee, as well as numerous other, uh, you've represented the council on numerous other committees, um, including the Summer Flounder Scup Black Sea Bass, Bluefish, Surf Clam and Ocean Quahog, Research Steering, uh, the New England Council's Habitat Committee, uh, which with you leaving sends me off to Boston next week, which is okay, that'll be fine. Uh, I get to spend some time with Peter, which is always fun, um, and the Executive Committee. So thanks for everything that you've done uh, for the council and as part of the council. and. I, I will say, though, as another as another um, thing over the over time, you know, saying goodbye sometimes is easier. If this is the right way to say it, it's easier sometimes than others. And this isn't one of those cases. So, you know, we certainly are all going to miss you, uh, but we know that you will certainly be back. You're not going to disappear, uh, and we'll see you. I'm sure at at one of our next meetings coming up if there's an issue that that you know is part of the work that you do um, and you know we look forward to that so please stay stay in touch and stay stay close uh, we certainly look forward to seeing you again soon so with that Kate on behalf of the Mid-Atlantic Council and in gratitude and appreciation the Mid-Atlantic Council I'm sorry the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council recognizes you Kate Wilkie uh, for your distinguished service to the council and outstanding contribution to the conservation and management of our na nation's marine fisheries resources. So thank you very much, Kate, and I'd like to present you with this, uh, with this acknowledgement, or the box is what we refer to it as. <laughs> Someday my name will be on there. <laughs> Thank you. 
I didn't know I was going to get a box. That's exciting. Um, it's been fun, everyone. Um, I really enjoyed this three years. It went very fast. Um, but I was around before I got to sit here at the table, and I'm not going to disappear. I'll be over in the peanut gallery with Greg and Bonnie and everyone. So um, I look forward to seeing you guys, you know, in the in the near future. And I'll look on the bright side and, and be happy that I don't have to be at every session of every meeting. <laughs> but thank you. It's been fun. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, and so, so tomorrow, as part of our process, we'll start tomorrow's meeting with the, uh, the reappointment and uh, of the current members of the council who are being reappointed, and we'll also bring in uh, our new um, appointment as well. So we'll do that first thing. But before we get to that, we have a reception this evening uh, that everyone is welcome to attend. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Chris. I do not know the exact details of that. So I'm going to ask Chris if he can pull his mic nice and close so everyone can hear. And, uh, and then I'll go to Eric. We'll go to Eric before we wrap up. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, to further honor Kate, we're going to have a reception tonight. Uh, the reception is uh, going to have fresh seafood provided by Peter in Atlanta Capes. So thank you, Peter in Atlanta Capes. The reception is down the street. It's not too far away. It's at the uh, Lowe's Philadelphia Hotel. The exact address is 1200 Market Street. So I think that's like three blocks away. The uh, reception is going to start at 6. Uh, if you didn't let uh, Shelly know that you were going to come tonight, that's fine. You could still show up. Uh, we'll take your money at the door. The reception is $40. Uh, we can do that there. Uh, there will be a cash bar available. Again, it starts at 6 o'clock. Peter. Peter. Room number, suite number. Good point. It's on, um, we have the whole 33rd floor. So I think it's all the way at the top. Go ahead, Peter. I, and I have a follow-up. Somebody asked me if there was a dress code earlier, and what I should have said as an answer was, you know what, I was in that Lowe's bar last night, dressed in flip-flops, shorts, and a golf shirt. They were perfectly happy taking my money. So that was my dress code yesterday. Understood. And it's, it's, it's August in Philadelphia, and it's hot. So it's certainly understandable if people want to dress down. Uh, that's not a problem. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of the New England Council, I do want to thank Ms. Wilkie for being on our couple of our committees, uh, the EBF committee, and in particular the Habitat Committee, which I happen to be the chair. And I, I really appreciate her always being prepared and polite. And you'll be missed. So thank you very much on behalf of the council. All right, thanks, Eric. Okay, we are on recess uh, until tomorrow morning, and we'll see everyone at the reception this evening. Thank you.